Hello, Luke. Thank you so much for, for coming on today. Salve, Xiaoma. A little kind okay. of dual language right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, well, well, let's let's talk about this. So, um, I've seen your videos online. You speak Latin like a like an ancient Roman. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I want to. I want to. Let's say it. Put it that way. Could you like do an introduction to yourself Gert in 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 Latin? Gertissime amica, mi nomen est uh, Lucius Amadeus Ranierius, natusum in Pennsylvania. Eh, sum quid sum triginta sex anos natus, atque quid etian ego, ego sum youtuber ut tu, et apud uh, canale meum ego facio contenta, latine et graeque. Ecce, there we go. Okay, <laughs> so would you say you speak fluent Latin? Like, I do, like absolutely. If you were, so if you were dropped, <laughs> if you were just dropped in like ancient Rome, like you could be chatting with Caesar, like ordering some Roman pizza. Yeah, and not just me. The, and like as far as how many people, you know, it's really just estimating like how many people can get along um, with some kind of fluency in Latin. It's at least yeah. 20,000 at this point. And uh, it's been growing a lot in the past few decades, thanks to the internet, thanks to the chances that we get to communicate and practice and, uh, you know, share audiobooks and things like that and make right. YouTube content. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, uh, not only me, but, but many others could easily get around. Of course, you know, we, what we think about the pronunciation where we have a lot of really solid ideas about it, but yeah. I bet when we get there, there'll be way more variety than we right. had ever suspected. Like if you experienced probably, right, you learn the standard form of, of Mandarin True. and then you got, of course, the Beijing dialect and all these different, you know, little, little varieties. Right. So who knows what that would be like, but I think we could all adapt to that. You speak Latin and ancient Greek too? Yeah, ancient Greek's coming along. Ancient Greek's harder to try to learn how to speak. Um, because I don't know modern Greek very well yet. Uh, right. And it helps to know like modern Romance language and learn Latin, yeah. you know, Italian. Do you want to try saying something in ancient Greek? Malistagia. Sure. Okay. Ego <laughs> Lukios. <laughs> Okay, uh, what else? Uh, ego, um, ego, uh, I really love ancient Greek. Uh, dialo, what else? Like a modern day uh, Aristotle, man. It's, it's amazing. Udamos, not at all. Udamos. Ugibi, Aristoteles, oh, Safotatos, he's the, the wisest. I studied Latin and, and ancient Greek in high school, but I forgot most of it but um what, what's your what's your what's your story like how did you how did you get into this and why latin like where did this come from it is a crazy strange story because um a lot of the other wonderful people i get to work with have uh you know their degrees advanced degrees in classics and latin and uh, i kind of fell into it just because i ended up loving it uh so much so i started out uh, I mean, in college, I did my bachelor's and master's in geological sciences, yeah. but I had um, was able to learn Latin with a wonderful book that a lot of us talk about, which is called Lingua Latina per se illustrata. And I think um, you have also studied a bit of uh, Latin and ancient Greek, right? In the past? Yeah, in high school, yeah. Yeah, probably don't remember a lot of it. And I would guess probably by the method. Were you like just learning to translate grammar right. based? Yeah, it was a lot of like, you know, textbook study. And then we would try to translate stuff. Ah, terrible. You yeah. don't need to, did you need to learn how to translate to become a right. fluent Chinese speaker? Right. No. I, and, and it's, it's an, I think the methods that you learn, like the, the, the way people learn things in high school is really, is really not a great, not a great way. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It, it can, depends, especially when you get the, have an immersion experience, a little bit harder in Latin, but there are a lot of really cool organizations that do full immersion, conversational Latin stuff. Did you start learning in high school and mm. no. No, I was learning German in high school. And then uh, in, um, it was uh, college, I went, I studied abroad in Italy. And then I, because I wanted to get fluent in Italian, I wanted yeah. to learn that as my other language. And when I was there in Florence, I was like, oh my gosh, there's Latin everywhere. And Rome, I just was enchanted. And I thought, yeah, I want to learn Latin. How do I do that? I found that book I mentioned. And in three months, because that book is so good. Yeah. I mean, and I'm, you know, was very interested in learning languages. Uh, I know probably a lot of uh, people out uh, here on this channel too are like that. They just want to yeah. like, mm, they want to go for it. And that book was the key. That book is so it's an enjoyable story about this Roman family and the slaves escape and they try to go back to, you know, it's really fun and entertaining. And it teaches you all the grammar, all the basic vocabulary and you retain it because if you've heard of the effective filter, it's a Stephen Krashen term. 
Yeah, it's from like a comprehensible input. So the uh, effective, like the emotional filter you have, if you have a, an enjoyable experience, like if you get to hang around, you know, a good time in Shanghai with friends or something, you're going to remember yeah. those expressions. Like I remember distinct phrases I learned in Italy and in Japan because of the events and the people I was with. But if you have this really unpleasant, painful experience, like in Monty Python and uh, the life of Brian, where he's, where he's getting, you know, at sword point, like remember right. it. And he's like, oh, yeah, he'll remember it for that little yeah. exam. But is that going to help him remember or love the Latin language? No, it's mm -hmm. going to push him away. So uh, my effective filter in the, with respect to that, that book, that Familia Romana book, was great. So then I just loved it. I picked it up uh, right away. Just like, I mean, I, I worked every day on it for three months. I transcribed the whole book because I wanted to like really internalize it. And this um, is in college. Yeah, yes, yeah, so second year of college in the summer between second and third year. Huh. And then when I went back to Italy, I took um, relatively advanced literature courses in Latin at the University of Florence because I, in three months, I accomplished what most Italians aren't able to do in all of high school in their first years of college, um, just because of how good the book is, because it gives you what you need instead of doing a lot of other things that you don't need to do. Right. Um, so that's how, how I got into it. And then from there, I'm just like, I wanted to find people to speak with. And I did find some in Italy, then found some in the US. And and then uh, then I did almost nothing with Latin for like eight years. Uh, I was, right. uh, I still am uh, National Guard in the military and, and doing a lot of uh, aviation stuff. Yeah. But then, then I wanted like, you know, I really want to keep doing this. And I, I got back into it, found that in that eight year hiatus where I was doing like like nothing, the community exploded thanks to the Internet. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is something I want to, you know, really be a part of again. It's just so, so moving how welcoming yeah. the community is. Wow. So you, so you learned from this. You're, you're in Italy, I guess, I guess, learning Italian. Um, and you, you pick up this book, you're, you're reading three months, you know, you get, you have this ability to, to take classes in Latin and people, they're teaching, um, courses in Latin in Italy. They, they are, but not usually the university level. No, usually they're it's like, it's like the Vatican or something. <laughs> No, you know what? The Vatican does almost nothing in Latin anymore. It's really? mostly Italian and English. Yeah, they've all sort of given up. And that's a shame. Maybe they'll, with this non-religiously uh, non affiliated kind of just open to yeah. everybody community that we have. I mean, of course, there are religious organizations. There are Catholic ones in Italy and in the U.S. and other places which do like to cultivate spoken Latin. But I think generally they're in the minority. Mostly they're just enthusiasts who with an interest in the classics, the classical languages of Latin and ancient Greek. Yeah, but uh, no, I, I took the classes. They were just regular, like Italian about the literature. And one of the oral exams I remember was to recite lines of poetry from um, uh, the the uh, Aeneids and some other Virgil stuff, one of the eclogues. And because I had been practicing speaking it for those three months while I was re learning the language, because I wanted to you know, have that kind of oral proficiency. Um, I, you know, th this teacher was kind of getting into the idea of like, yeah, let's recite stuff out loud. That'll be part of the oral exam. That was new. And for me, it was the easiest thing ever just to spout off the first lines of the Aeneid because I already yeah. been doing that, you know. Arma virumque cano, troia qui primus aboris, italian fato profugus, la vigna que ve nit litora. You don't have to say it like that. You can say it normal, but I'm just having fun. And right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I remember um, uh, I did I did AP, uh, two AP Latin classes, I think AP Virgil and AP, um, yeah, but but um, but no, we, we never recited Virgil like that. Mm. Um, kind of a shame because that would have been cool. I mean, Latin is, you know, it's been a dead language for thousands of years. How do people, how do people know what Latin sounded like? Mm, yeah. So, and there are three ways. Uh, the, uh, one of the ways we have is that we have living languages ascended from it. So of course we have Spanish, we have Italian, Romanian, uh, yeah. French, Portuguese are big ones, Catalan, Sardinian. So there's a lot of these romance languages that we can compare and get an idea. So we can have like a pretty good idea that Latin is within certain boundaries. It wouldn't sound identical to any of those languages at all, but you get, okay, so it's gonna, probably we have like R, and that's probably a sound in it because most of those languages have R. Um, even all the French has a even the modern French doesn't. And um, so we have uh, that as one point. Then we can go and we can, the best part though, is to read the ancient Roman writings and when they talk about these things, they talk about it in great detail. And it's interesting because none of them are trained linguists in the modern way. So they have to, uh, they just explain it like, you know, and probably too, when you've been, been learning, um, I don't, uh, like the difference between uh, the pinyin letter G and the letter K. Like you might learn like, oh, it's ga and ka. 
And then later you learn, oh, that's actually a difference of aspiration. They're both voiceless consonants, right? It's ka and ga, right? Uh, like gong instead of, uh, you know, gong or something, which I'm sure yeah. can exist in some variety. It's those kinds of details that the native speakers aren't necessarily capable of clearly distinguishing, especially when they have like pinyin, which think, makes you think, okay, that's how it is in English and that can be confusing. But despite all that, we have great detail about all sorts of, of uh, varieties. And the other way is linguistically, morphologically, how do languages evolve? We can, um, we have so many great attestations of changes in the modern era of languages. And so we can see those changes. So we get a pretty good, I'd say, I think 95% of what we do conservatively is extremely accurate. And that there's, of course, a lot of wiggle room, you know, there's, who knows the different kinds of registers and accents and intonation, but I think we can get pretty close. So, so, so people like, I guess the 20,000 community of, of Latin speakers, like they're not, this isn't just something you guys are like making up. Like your people are pretty sure based on a lot of evidence that mm. this is how Latin sounded like. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, a lot of people aren't super interested in that. I am um, right. because uh, the I think it's, it, you know, it's just cool. You know, it's, we're learning modern languages like like you have. You know that there is like this this really big importance when you learn a modern language yeah. to achieve a decent pronunciation because of effectiveness of communication with native speakers and just sort of like just seems like it's part of it. But when you don't have a native population. I mean, most people aren't super concerned about that. So maybe they'll do things like, um, like the word Caesar is Geisar in the restored classical pronunciation. Um, but a, an American or uh, an Englishman, for example, who's speaking Latin, maybe they can't do a ra. And maybe they'll do a ka instead of an unaspirated ka. So they'll say Kaisar or something. Um, is that wrong? Or is that just part of their accent? Is that, you know, like, so I think it's really important for us to, you know, not be severe on people who just don't care that much to d do that. And yeah, so that's, that's how I'd, I'd say about that. Mm -hmm. So speaking of accents, you speak Latin with what seems to me anyway, a very good accent. Oh, and I, I feel like it's, it's funny because whenever, like, at least for me, the, the main thing that I think of when I think of Latin in media is Monty Python. So, I, <laughs> and then, you know, some of the movies from the fifties and such, and, and, and it, it always seems to me to have like this, uh, this kind of British accent, mm. but people, ancient Romans probably didn't speak with a, with a British accent, did they? No, no. And I, I've done a lot of uh, really fun research looking at all of those really kind of micro romance languages yeah. with only, you know, a few thousand speakers in Italy and Spain and other places. There's some nice websites which document the variations. And there seems to be kind of a general intonation pattern in Mediterranean languages. So modern romance languages, as well as Greek, seem to have a lot of things in common. So I try to more or less sound kind of like an Italian. Um, because when I speak Italian, I have a little accent. I don't have a perfect sounding Italian when I speak Italian, even though I'm fluent. Um, and uh, combined with some things that are in Spanish, but it's it's a lot of it's aesthetic. You know, it's it's mostly just like ah, this seems like an approximation. It seems close enough. I love when Italians or Spaniards, as well as many others, Sardinians, for example, speak Latin because I think they really they really teach me. Every time I hear them, I'm like oh, I, I want to do that tiny little mm. thing that I hear. And do, do a lot of Italians and Spaniards learn Latin, like relative to Americans? Or? That's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, like learning. Who, who are the, who are the of, of the 20,000 people learning who speak Latin, who, who, who are they? Like, who are I they? A lot of them are American, are, yeah, from the US and, uh, and uh, Canada too. And the reason seems to be that we are, like as far as like fluent speakers, so many are coming out of the US now because we don't have a centralized education system, which mm -hmm. means that there's a lot more potential for experimentation <laughs> down even at the teacher level. Yeah. And that's really un not allowed in places like Italy. So yeah. when it comes to actually taking classes, I think per capita way more Italians because I think it's at least 60% of Italians going through school, they're going to get some kind of Latin, if not years of it. But like you, they just do translation. So yeah, yeah they'll learn things about the language, but how will, we, will they retain that? And will that even uh, bring them to be able to read fluently? Usually not, right. because just translating doesn't really teach you to read. You know, when you think Latin conference, like you just kind of imagine like a group of nerdy academics meeting in like a hotel ballroom. Like, like what are these, what are these, <laughs> like, so I mean, much better. right. So, so, so what does this actually, like, what does the Latin community actually look like? You're mentioning mm. this online events, like do people meet up in person, like where, 
you know, how, how does this, how does this look like? Oh yeah. And looking forward to the end of COVID too. So yeah. we can get back to, cause every summer usually, cause the vast majority are either students or teachers. Right. And then there are enthusiasts um, who weren't te- like, I wasn't teaching Latin when I started. Now I do. And I love it. Um, but um, the, uh, yeah, they, for the most part, they're, <clears throat> they're concentrated on improving um, spoken skill in the context of being able to use it to understand literature better. And I'll let you know what I mean. We, if we, we keep saying the goal is reading and it is true and, but it doesn't mean we can't enjoy every part about the, the spoken thing. So what we would rather do if that goal is to understand what we're reading better, just like if we're, you know, we're going to read Shakespeare, shouldn't we speak English? If we're going to read that, or we're going to discuss, um, you know, Jane Austen or something, should we discuss it in German? I mean, we could, but if we stay within the language, we're constantly using the words and the idioms as we discuss it. So you never have to do that code switching thing. You're constantly in the language. So a lot of it focuses on doing that, which is super fun. You know, you might be you know, sitting in a circle. It's really, they're usually very informal and pleasant experiences and have uh, some someone who's guiding um, the discussion about, uh, could be the Aeneid, for example, or usually they get stuff that's not super common, not the stuff that you do in high school. And so you get to see this really cool, like Renaissance literature or other stuff that's more arcane in the classical period that doesn't always get touched on. And, uh, and then you uh, read it, uh, maybe take chances reading. And then the leader will ask questions like, oh, what do you think about, about that usage there when, um, I don't know, when, when Juno goes to see uh, Iolus uh, in the, the beginning of the Aeneid, right? You, just to use an example that people might know. Um, what is she, uh, you know, what is she doing? What happened? What is she so upset about? And you talk about, oh, because of the judgment of Paris, Eudicium Baridis, you know, because he was the one who judged those, those three goddesses and he didn't say Juno was the most beautiful because Aphrodite promised him Helen, you know, all those kinds of things. So if you, the idea there would be for someone in that group then to offer that as an answer in Latin. So you're like, ah, and then we can look in the, the literature and see that's what's going on here. That's what the poet's trying to convey to us. So how long you've been studying Latin for, for years at this point, right? Yeah, I'd say actual like concerted study, yeah. including the past few years. So 2018, 19, 20, so four years plus probably another four, oh five to oh nine. So I guess yeah. it's technically eight. And then a long hiatus, I did relatively little. Right. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's been since 2005. And so what's, what's been your motivation? Like what, like why, what, what attracted you to Latin so much in the first place? And mm. then what keeps, like, what keeps you going? Like, why does it, what, what attracts you about learning? Like most, most people would be like, like, why, why would you want to learn? Why, dead would you, why on earth is dead right. language? Who cares? Yeah. And it is, even though people speak it today, linguistically, a dead language is one with no native speakers. Right. I do know children, though, who are being brought up by their parents who are also, who've learned to speak Latin. No. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, they're the and wonderful uh, this, uh, this little... In, in America? Yeah, in, in the U.S. and in Italy. Yeah, I know. I've, I've, I've met a couple. Uh, I've seen met some in person. I've uh, met a lot of them online because they're like online chats and things where people can just hang out and talk in Latin or ancient Greek, and which are really fun. And they're so impressive because they do their little... I mean, they speak with their parents all day long in both languages, and so they can just... So they, they come in the chats and they're like, oh, say salve. And I say salve, Luki. You know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you're so precious and wonderful. And it's so, but still, I wouldn't really call that, you know, linguistically speaking, like uh, truly uh, native because it's, there's no monolingual community, right. right? It doesn't exist at the moment. Maybe that'll happen. I don't know. Probably not. We probably don't want that to happen because why on earth would you want to read, want to speak Latin? And the reason is because you want to be able to uh, read the stuff in the original because yeah. what's, so uh, amazing is that most of all of human knowledge, except for, of course, the massive um, corpuses we have out of uh, China um, that stretch back, obviously, thousands of years, most of it's written in Latin and Greek. And then we have, of course, a lot in Persian and Arabic, but the vast majority of printed books of history, of human knowledge is in Latin and then uh, Greek as well. Uh, to a somewhat lesser extent, but so much of it is in Latin. And you know how much has been translated? Like a couple percentage points at most. Mm. So in order to access, you know, the basic stuff about, you know, if you're interested in something really important, like um, the details of certain administrative things that were happening in a uh, medieval uh, a kingdom or something, that stuff's been recorded, but it's not in any other language but Latin. Right. So if you want to understand this important historical stuff, you're either dependent on a translator or you just 
can learn the language and you can read it. And that's what I think is attracting people. The fact that you can access philosophy and some of the most amazing poetry ever written in the original. So for you, for you then learning to speak the language and getting fluent in it is really a way to access the literature. Would you say? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's the, that's definitely the party line. And that's important because we're not, I, the, there are some people out there who would, yes, let's revive it as an auxiliary language, mm -hmm. like instead of Esperanto or something, yeah. or I, there was even the, um, some people, I think in uh, the French, uh, members of the European Union who are saying, oh, now that UK is out of of uh, the European Union, why not bring back Latin or something? And I'm not opposed per se, but there's a problem with trying to make the language alive again. If it's truly a living language, it will change. And, and if it changes so much that, for example, uh, Hebrew, uh, which has been revived, obviously, uh, yeah. was a completely dead language, and now it's a totally native monolingual spoken language with a large community. There was a problem, maybe you call it a problem, not necessarily, but in the restoration of it, it was mixed with a lot of other things of other native speakers. Like it wasn't like super tightly controlled and you can't, it's like creating, it's like Jurassic Park, you know, it's uh, life will find a way. It's gonna keep growing and expanding in, in different ways inevitably. And if we, you know, if you strictly control it, you can only do that so long. Like the French are very tight about their own language, right? They want to keep everything really restricted and avoid anglicisms. But inevitably, it's going to be pushed and changed just a little bit, even if you have a lot of conservative forces in that language. So if we make it that it's truly a native language of a lot of people, and we want to go be that, that'll be great for like a century. It'll still be great after that. I still think it's really cool. But the problem is then native speakers after a few hundred years, just like we yeah. have difficulty reading Shakespeare, they will have difficulty reading uh, the literature that we're trying to imitate in our speech today in Latin. Right. So it may not be a good idea. So, so your, your interest is really connecting with the classics then. Yeah. But the other part, which is, I think, even better, is the community. Because these mm -hmm. wonderful, one of my best friends around the world that, uh, you know, some of them I, you know, I've met, never met, uh, but I've only ever spoken with so many of them ever in Latin. I don't know these wow. people for years because there's so no need. You have entire friendships just in Latin. Dozens. <laughs> Absolutely. Acquaintances, okay. people abroad. And yeah. Yeah, it really is. And it's so nice. You know, we could, we could like, I speak Italian comfortably. A lot of them are Italian, or they could be Spanish or whatever. But yeah. why? Why when I can just enjoy? Because we want to. We get enjoyment out of the skill of practicing, as I'm sure you do, right? With yeah. your English speaking uh, uh, Chinese friends, right? Yeah. You don't, if you can get the chance to enjoy practicing speaking Chinese, you would rather do that, I assume, right? Yeah. And why does speaking, you, you mentioned this earlier and you're, you're totally right. I'm curious about your perspective as to what, like, why do you think that learning to speak is helpful for learning to read? Because I think for a lot of people, it's very unintuitive. Like if you want to learn to read, just translate a whole bunch of stuff and memorize grammar, right? And you know what? That's been a perspective of people for many generations. Yeah. Uh, what we call like the, tra the traditional methods of learning Latin and ancient Greek actually aren't traditional except in the past like couple hundred years. Before that, it was completely normal to gain basic conversational fluency, in fact, really good fluency, mm. and then be able to discuss everything and do everything in class. I mean, we had Amer the first uh, American universities back in the 18th, early 19th century. We're still doing most of the classes in Latin. That's always used to, you know, Magna Cum Laude and all that stuff on our certificates, because mm. that was the only language. We're not doing it just to venerate something from thousands of years ago. That was the language of instruction. Um, and that was the case in Germany and England and for, for the longest time, but obviously things changed. But um, the if we now you could theoretically just read and never speak, but there has to be because reading what reading is, if we just look at, for example, you don't have you have this ability that I don't have. When you see any uh, Chinese, you s perceive you read it spontaneously. Well, what is that? Um, like if I look at it, it just looks like to me, they look like uh, Chinese. That's what I mean, like the characters in, uh, in Japanese look like kanji, and I can maybe understand some of it, but it wouldn't necessarily leap out to me in the same way. Whereas you see a sentence, you're like, I know exactly what that is. And you just kind of say it, even unconsciously, or maybe in your own head. So there's this thing called the phonological loop, where when you um, see text, and you know that language, whether it's English or, or whatever, spontaneously, you will read it, and then sound happens in a part of the mind which actually creates a part of the brain, actually, which creates 
uh, an internal sound, like an echoing. And it does that, by the way, based on your experience of speaking and reading aloud the language for a long time before that. And then once that sound happens in the brain, then you understand it. Now, if we learn to read without, for example, we can learn to read with whatever pronunciation we want. It doesn't have to be good or whatever subjective way we want to describe the pronunciation. But sound has to be associated with it. Otherwise, we're not doing true reading of that language. So if we learn to speak it or to understand a lot of audio input and then tentatively slowly start to speak it, then when we can pick up a text and we can start to, uh, we can, we say it aloud to ourselves, we discuss it with others in the language in Latin, uh, then it becomes um, real, it becomes easy, it becomes fluid, yeah. it becomes normal. Yeah, I've noticed the same, the same with, with studying, you know, pretty much any other language. Like if you, it, to, to learn, to try to learn by, by like trying to sort of memorize grammar rules and vocabulary and then trying to translate stuff, it, it just isn't effective. And it, and it, and it like, to, to re, like your, your, your brain is, your brain has evolved over a very long period of time to be able to, to parse grammar rules through massive exposure, you know? Mm, and so exactly. learning to speak just, and, and, and hearing, getting lots of audio input and, and actually using active recall to be able to enforce these patterns in your brain um, just lets you be able to pick up on reading so much faster. Absolutely. Reading is, is a, something that we learn to do very late. It's a very, you know, uh, new technology as far yeah. as the evolution of uh, the human race. Um, but uh, yeah, the um, it's reading is, is something which is a consequence of speaking. So learning to translate doing, you know, it's completely upside down. It's the pyramid yeah. is upside down. If he's doing this, uh, you know, this analytical stuff first, here's what these cases and declensions and other grammatical things mean in conjugations. Right. And they're like, okay, and you barely, maybe you just even learn the endings. You don't even know what the, the example words are. It's just a terrible way to learn. It's a terrible way to learn. Yeah. Now, some people can enjoy it. Like some right. people out there really enjoy the painful aspects of mathematics. Yeah. And most of us could get good at mathematics, I think, if we had yeah. more teachers who were, you know, doing a more intuitive approach, perhaps. But um, yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. that's how it goes. I mean, I spent I spent years in high school learning Latin or attempting to learn Latin Greek in that in that way, just memorizing declensions and conjugations, and and I, I can't speak a word of Latin today as, as a result. You know, it's, it is easy. It's just, yeah. Why you? But yeah, it's like uh, yeah. I don't know. It's like doing so, something absurdly backwards. It's like chopping down a tree and then expecting it to become a house. It's like that's right. not. I mean, you'll succeed in chopping down the tree, but you're not going to have a house at the end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. How, well, about you? How do you get uh, through your 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 series to where you are now? In in Chinese or yeah. in, in Latin? In I mean, I mean, for me, you know, for me, for me, with with Chinese, I I always had the approach, and I still do with languages of like, like learning to read is not important. I mean, it, it's important. It, it is important, but but it don't like being able to understand what you hear and 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 to be able to respond like is the most has always been the most important thing for me and reading, reading when important, like when you, when you want to learn how to like, it, I don't think it's the case with all languages that you necessarily want to learn how to read. Like some languages are not written typically. Right. So, so many dialects of Chinese, for example, you would never write in that, in that language, you would write in Mandarin instead. So there's no reason to to even get any practice with that. But, you know, of course with lots of languages you do want to read, but, the approach I've always taken, at least after high school, <laughs> when I started to to really try and like think about how do you, how do you actually learn a language, um, has been to learn to speak first, and then the reading comes as a natural as a natural consequence of that. Mm. Yeah, there you go. Do you have you have you um you know I know you're studying Japanese. Mm. Have you how has that gone for you? And have you tried to apply the methods you've learned to learning Latin towards that? Of course. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was in Japan for three years, mm, but it's been, oh my gosh, it's been since 2015. That's how long it's been since I've bothered to study one of my favorite languages, which is Japanese. You lived in Japan for three years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got wow. conversationally comfortable, I'd, I'd say basic conversational fluency. Yeah. And I was teaching it uh, to Americans uh, on base uh, for a while in yeah. Tokyo as a night class, really basic elementary stuff. And a lot of this stuff that we were just talking about was essential. Like, okay, there's some basic grammar to learn, but a lot of the ways that Japanese is normally taught, 
even in perhaps somewhat ironically by the Japanese themselves, is very top heavy on the grammar sure. and not giving this clear sense of what's going on. Um, I don't remember. Have you studied uh, Japanese too? Not, not really. I mean, I yeah. know a few words and stuff, but no. it's not that hard. It's uh, it's made out to be way more challenging than it really is. And but just like you, I mean, really any language, if you have enough input, can become just as easy as any other. If the effective yeah. filter, if you you know enjoy it, you're going to be able to get a lot out of it. And obviously, right. written languages such as in uh, uh, Japanese and Chinese presents lots of challenges that we have to yeah. adapt to. But I mean, there's phonology and stuff like that you have to go through. But really, just if you have enough exposure, interest, and the right tools, there's no reason we can't learn any language. And how did you how did you learn how did you learn to speak uh, Japanese? I was just uh, I was just there, and I was really eager to do it. And I found it. I hit a wall. Yeah. Right away, because I wasn't like, oh, this is taking me a while. And I wasn't, uh, I was living on base, so I wasn't able to, I was had some, you know, co-workers there who were Japanese, but I wasn't able to constantly be totally immersed. I tried to create my own in immersion environment. So I watched a lot of stuff, but I found uh, a really basic grammar guide online. And I learned the, the basic conjugations of everything, some simple vocabulary. And then just going out, making friends, talking. And then I had a, yeah. a decent command of uh, the grammar and was able to un understand what people were saying. And then once I caught up with uh, all of that, it just really came with uh, that kind of practice. What reactions do Italians have when you <laughs> speak in Latin? Oh, that's fun. I want to try that again soon. What reactions? Uh, I, I want to see. I want to see American shocks Romans by speaking perfect Latin. <laughs> Well, oh gosh, perfect. I certainly don't have perfect anything, much less Latin, but uh, it's close I, uh, enough, man. I mean, uh, okay, yeah, it's uh, it's, it, I, that's I'm gonna do that. You know what? You, you, that's you, the, the gauntlet has been thrown down. I will do that, I'll do it soon. Uh, like yeah. when people, when people are aware that you speak Latin, like whether in Japan or Italy or the US, like what are what are what are people, what's people's first question? Like, what are they, why? Why? <laughs> why? <laughs> but we talked about why. So we, I, I, I tell them the same kind of thing. Like, oh, yeah. because you get, you get to understand what people have been saying. And, and if you learn to speak it too, which is so enjoyable, right. suddenly you can get affected by a poem like, um, uh, yeah. I don't know, a poem by Avin when he was exiled and he was so sad. And his book, and his, he has his whole book of poetry called Sad Things, a triste, yeah, where he talks about how sad yeah. he is when he's exiled in uh, Dacia. And uh, he and you get to feel like, oh, my gosh, he's so sad away from his family right. and everything. or one of his happy or anybody's happy poems. And you feel like it's a kind of alien world in a sense that you, you we, ha we can't go to the Circus Maximus and see the horse races. We can see it in our mind. But when he's like in the one poem where Avid is talking to his girlfriend and saying, um, no nego no bilium sedeos to the osu secorum. I'm not here to enjoy the horse races. Cuita manipsa faues, winca to dile precor. But whichever one you want to win, let him win. Um, ut locura te cum veni, te cum que sedere. I'm here to sit with you and talk with you, honey. Um, because she likes the horse races. And just so that you know that I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, that I love you, that I care about you. So it's re and it's kind of like, yeah. And we've been there, right? We've done that kind of thing. And it's like, wow. So you get this instant sense that everything that we go through in our lives, uh, such as, even though it feels really long to us, is actually a link in a chain which is going forward and stretches back into uh, the depths of, of time. And the human yeah. experience is really the same. And there's something comforting and philosophically nice about that. Yeah, you probably empathize a lot more with, um, with the literature. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting lessons, too. The Roman Republic has been studied to death, literally. Not, well, literally right. the deaths in the Roman Republic, I'm thinking of Caesar and, and all that and the civil wars. And they always present an interesting and important example, I think, for any um, society to look at because it's just this like, wow, you have this one kind of society and it changes and, you know, for what we call republic and empire. And, you know, how that happened. Why was it good? Was it bad? Was Caesar a good guy? Was he a bad guy? There's no clear answer to any of this. But that's why it makes good rhetorical and philosophical um, study. So if you can do it in the original, you don't have to depend on, uh, you know, translation or even a really good YouTube video. You can just yeah. enjoy it for yourself. Wow. Yeah. So do you feel like at the point where you are now, like, how do you feel about, about this, like, pinnacle of Latin achievement that you've reached? <laughs> like... 
Like, well, that's very flattering, and not I would never ever call um, what I love to do any the pinnacle of anything because it feels yeah. like there's this metaphor of uh, climbing Parnassus, which has been around for a while. I think it was the past few centuries someone came up with that term. Parnassus is a mountain in, in Greece, and uh, climbing it is difficult. It's like I don't know, like climbing up Mount Fuji or not quite Kilimanjaro, but you know, it's a it's a hike, and to do it requires you know kind of constancy of effort and with all of the stuff that's out there. I mean, how can I feel like I've reached a pinnacle of anything if I've, like most people, only read a fraction of the literature that's available? No yeah. human being, I think, could ever read everything in Latin because it's literally almost everything that's been written until um, the more recent times when we have, of course, all this digital information. You know, most of it was in, in Latin. And uh, the, yeah, just all the Google books that are in Latin alone. So, um, and even of the classical literature, one can spend a lifetime just reading all of that a few times. And that's it. That's that's 50 years. You know, it's just takes yeah. that even when you're a fluent reader, it takes that yeah. long to get good. So uh, but where do I want to go? I want to keep learning Latin. My ancient Greek needs a lot of work. It's really uh, compared to a lot of uh, wonderful people and colleagues, friends out there who are so good at it. Just yeah. in the infancy stages. And I, and I love it so much, too, because it's right. it's like Latin, but it's a little bit harder. It's a little bit different. It's like, oh, this is kind of exotic now you know it's kind of yeah it, it I, I remember like in high it just it it was always like the like the exotic one like like something something's different about this you know it's Did a little you more want different to learn latin and greek or was it part of your curriculum i mean i, I it wasn't it was a self-selection but i think but i think um it was it was just kind of this like this like family thing where like oh you know it's it's like the the prestigious thing to do or like it'll look good you know on your college application good for the sats good for, that, good for the sats yeah what do you feel about that yeah um that's the utilitarian argument right right why should you learn something with which doesn't seem to have utilitarian value yeah. uh you know, if you want to learn chinese for for business or working there or uh one is uh would have a spouse who's uh from china for example that's an, an obvious practical reason there's relatively no practical reason except to maybe become a teacher of the language yeah. um so that's that's uh you know an interesting argument uh against it one thing that people try to do and i think they overemphasize it to the point of it being detracting to the study itself is to say, oh, it's good for the SATs or it's good to make your mind logical. That's another mm -hmm. one we need to tear down. That's a terrible argument. I, I always found this argument so silly because like you could also learn Spanish. You could, e you could equally say learning French is, is just as good for these, these, these outcomes. Like Absolutely. Completely. German or Russian. I mean, especially right. that's the thing too. Most people's imagination of what the language is, human language is like, most people say, where, where we hang around, you know, the, uh, you know, US, or maybe it's a Western Europe or something, people think language variety consists of English, Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Yeah. And that's the most people that study languages. So when they see something like an like ancient Greek has pitch accent, like Japanese, mm -hmm. but how many classicists and how many people trying to restore yeah. an ancient Greek pronunciation or speak it have studied Japanese? Yeah. I know too, I'm one of them. I, yeah. Maybe I could think of someone else who's looked at it. Um, so when I speak ancient Greek, I try to use a pitch accent system, which is, in, is similar yeah. to the Japanese, and it works for me. Um, but, uh, you know, so with people, you know, people have no idea of the fascinating variety that's out there. And I barely know anything. You know, that's, I mean, that's sort of the Dunning-Kruger thing, right? Like, I'm way down in the bottom there, like, oh, my gosh. I mean, so much to learn about Latin. And even as a comfortable, fluent speaker of Latin, there's so much still I can't wait to learn uh, my whole life for Latin. Ancient Greek, wow, I'm we were super in the infancy of, of that that too compared to, to Latin. And then having gotten the chance to look at a little bit of Chinese, having had uh, three wonderful years in Japan, seeing other languages in the world like Sanskrit and other languages from India, Arabic and Hebrew, ancient Egyptian I've taken a look at, you know, and, and the Slavic languages, right? Just the Slavic, la like Russian. Look at Russian. People think ancient Greek is hard. Right. Try all <laughs> those cases. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard crazy things about Russian. But people do it. They do it to fluency. Yeah, yeah, it's challenging compared to French. But English is filled with like 60% French vocabulary. So yeah. guess what? It's going to be a little bit different. But that doesn't mean people can't acquire the language. It's just so cool hearing you speak these these um, these ancient languages because, you know, if you've had any exposure to them in school, like it's it's never been never been spoken or like at best in like a British accent. 
you know, right. <laughs> yeah. an American accent. So, so to hear you actually pronounce it in a way that, that, um, you know, we think people would have, would have pronounced it is pretty, pretty amazing. Thanks. Yeah. And I want to emphasize again out there because our community is filled with so many people who speak fluently, but they don't care much about pronunciation. And yeah. I, I think too, because I talk about it so much, yeah. I talk about, oh yeah, this is like an accurate reconstruction of pronunciation. I think that kind of talk has put people off and I don't want to give that impression. If people want to learn Latin, we'll have an accent. It's fine. We'll all, we all understand. Like people use the traditional Italian yeah. or ecclesiastical pronunciation. I can speak Latin that way too. And it's, not wrong it's just a standard that's been used for spoken latin in italy for hundreds of years right. it's not the ancient one no i have a whole video which tells you why because which that's really interesting too like how these big debates that people get into like because um they get so like oh my gosh the flame wars <laughs> the, the, the the raging controversy about how raging this... Three thousand year old dead language is <laughs> 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 people get really attached to it for example yeah. um there are uh, because if people grow up like most Italians, they learn Latin in school and the Italian um, uh, Italians, for the most part, are the only ones who still use the ecclesiastical pronunciation in school um, outside of uh, the, the church. Other people usually say Germany, UK, France, Spain and so forth, for the most part, use the aversion of the restored classical pronunciation. Doesn't mean that they necessarily sound more like an ancient Roman, right. even than an Italian, because there's more than just like. Gaisad instead of Jezad or something. There's a lot of different possibilities there. But um, what happens is they, it's it's so funny. And I think it's tied into the um, 30 years war and to that, that schism between Northern Europe and Southern Europe, uh, between the, uh, the changes between the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, um, amnity, which still exists between Northern Europeans um, just because of geography and culture or whatever. And then uh, the, <laughs> and it's so funny because what's so interesting, it seems that people want when reconstructing a pronunciation of either Greek, ancient Greek or, or Latin is they want to feel that the pronunciation that is most familiar to them is the right one. And therefore they feel the need to justify its existence in the past. Modern Greeks, for example, are kind of notorious for this even more than Italians because they will not all of them, uh, by far. I know plenty who are well-educated in the matter and they realize, okay, no, the pronunciation's changed. But there are even still like professional uh, doctorate people out there from Greece who, are, who try to still push like, hey, the modern Greek pronunciation, oh, it was already the regular pronunciation everywhere, right. even in Athens in the fifth century BC. And yeah. that paper is like, and it's just like, you, no, we have the clear evidence to the contrary. Right. But it's this kind of cherry picking and trying to find like what this. Oh, they're doing this thing. And that must be, you know, all these kinds of like, that you go. That's it. So then so it's and but so they're not doing it scientifically, in my opinion, not linguistically, scientifically. Well, uh, if they are insist upon that, but they're motivated because they feel like their identity is connected to that pronunciation system. Yeah. So, however, if Greeks or anyone wants to use the modern Greek pronunciation to enjoy the literature, even saying it aloud of ancient Greek, have fun. That's fine. If people want to use the ecclesiastical pronunciation of Latin for Latin, even spoken Latin or using Latin, I, you know, you just, it's like having a British accent and an American accent and people working together. It's fine. It's not a problem at all. Um, so I think it's important to, to, because people out there are like, this is the right one. I used to be, uh, hey, I used to be like that. I used to feel like, we should just use the class. I even have a video where I kind of sort of say that. Yeah. I, I retract that now. And I, my more recent videos are like that. We're like, no, it's, it's fine. Yeah. You can use whatever pronunciation you want. Right. As long as you're having fun and getting something out of it. Yeah. And it kind of reminds me how like um, uh, in, in China, when people read Confucius, like they're going to be reading it in a, 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 a modern Mandarin pronunciation, which is mm. extremely anachronistic. But like the way the Chinese was pronounced back then was like like to totally different. Have you studied it? I don't know anything about it. No, I I I mean I've I've read up on it like a little bit, but I haven't really studied. But the pronunciation was extensively different. Um, like in the way things like it didn't have tones. I mean I, the vowel system was totally different. Mm. Um, but uh, but but I, I mean I, I take the view that it do it doesn't really matter, right? Like is I mean. I think it's good to know what the pronunciation was like, but like, if, you know, if you, well, if you really enjoy the literature and pronounce it in, in modern manner pronunciation, like, 
whatever. Yeah. Like if you're trying to t- do an historical movie or something and the Confucian, right. time, I don't know how well it's been, the pronunciations be construct, been constructed. Like, right. And if you, if people were to use the modern pronunciation and they were then trying to say at the same time, this is an accurate representation yeah. of the ancient language. Well, then people should rightly balk at that. Yeah. Um, just like an example would be, say, the Passion of the Christ was done with the ecclesiastical pronunciation of Latin. Yeah. And that pronunciation started to develop in uh, basically under um, Charlemagne in the ninth century. So it's like, doesn't work for first century uh, AD. Yeah. Does that mean it's bad? No. Why are they using that pronunciation? Because it's a movie with a certain audience that wants to hear that. Right. So what? Doesn't matter. You know, they did it, it using Aramaic and Latin in that movie was because it gives us other level of, of aesthetic. Does it have to be perfect? No. Are they going to be perfect? No. Even if they do it really well with every coach around them helping them are they going to make mistakes yes because i make mistakes (laughs) everybody makes mistakes wow yeah so that's that's sort of how it is so i think that's sort of the um uh the the kind of acceptance we have to have we can nitpick and i think it's fun to do that while at the same time saying hey actor doesn't speak that language doesn't speak ancient chinese doesn't speak or sorry i don't know what uh what the time period of ancient of chinese is of confucius what it's called of older version of chinese they don't speak latin but they're memorizing the lines I love it. Thank you. Right. For, I would say to those actors. Wow. What's next? Oh man, um, lots are next. I really enjoy doing um, the music videos. I don't know if you've seen any of them in Latin. Um, you make music videos in Latin? You haven't? Oh, you're gonna love them. They're on this channel. I, I, I saw. Channel. I saw the Alexa one. Oh, thanks. Yeah, they. they it's there still. My little prop yeah. is still there. Right. So, the so for for the for the audience, um, you made a video where. <laughs> You were speaking to Alexa in, in Latin. It was uh-huh. pretty, pretty impressive. Oh, thanks, um, man. That's yeah, good. and then and then sorry. So so the other you have other music videos in Latin. They're actually my most popular videos. I've done yes. a lot of Disney songs like uh, Under the Sea, Hic uh, mm-hmm. Mari, Hic Mari. It's a lot of fun. And uh, recently got to do Hellfire from Hunchback of Notre Dame. That's been really popular. People have liked that. Yeah, those are wow. get, get the most views on my my channel. So fucking yeah. amazing. So yeah. so so yeah. What um? Can you tell people where they should go to to follow you and check out your videos? Absolutely. So uh, the one is uh, so Scorpio Martin. Oh, I can't even. I'm losing my proper reception here. Uh, yeah, I'll put it on the, the screen. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Scorpio Martianus is uh, I just, that's one of my two channels. All content is in Latin and ancient Greek, and they're yeah exclusively Latin and ancient Greek on that that channel. <laughs> Um, and, uh, the, there are things there where you can learn, um, you, their whole series, you learn ancient Greek from the beginning, you learn Latin from the beginning. They're right there on the, on the main channel. So it's easy to find my other channel is called Polymathy. And I made that channel so I could talk about all the other stuff. I like other languages and science and other things I'm interested in. Mostly I've been doing like how to learn languages, ancient pronunciation, chronology, like all those changes. And I did the Monty Python uh, scene, Romanes e un domus. Right. Uh, and like Romani de domum, like, how, like why, that, why is that funny? And if we study Latin, like you did in school, yeah. you recognize, oh, that's so painful. And like, now I understand why Brian's in pain. A lot of people like the movie, but they might not understand it. So that's the kind of stuff I like to do on Polymathy. Should people learn Latin? Like, yes, if yeah. they if they want to, and uh, and you can, and it's fun. A lot of resources on my channels, which will get you started and connected yeah. to so much that's out there for Latin right. uh, and ancient Greek. You can learn them absolutely. If you can learn, if people are learning Chinese like they are uh, when they're following you, then this is yeah. not going to be. This is going to be pleasant and fun. Yeah. I promise. Wow. Thanks so much. I really cool. appreciate it. Thank so you. Much. Oh, how, how do I say that in Latin? Uh, so, uh, so if you want to say thank you, gracias. Yeah. Gracias. And we could say it longer, but that's a nice short way. Okay. And a way that we say you're welcome, which probably isn't an ancient one, but it's sort of a Renaissance expression, is libenter. 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 Bene. Libenter. Optime. Good job. Optime. <laughs> wow, dude. All right. Thanks so much, Luke. Make sure you guys go check out his channel.